The BRICS block is inundated with applications. The group of five major emerging economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, has attracted some 20 other countries to join. After Argentina, Iran and Algeria applied last year, Egypt, Ethiopia and Bangladesh submitted their applications weeks ago, and Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and Nigeria and more are queuing up. Hey, hey, everybody. It's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And did you know that the French President Macron has asked to attend the next BRICS in South Africa, which occurs in the third week of August? Well, here's the official stance from China on that request. What do you make of the French president's interest in getting invited as the first Western leader to be invited to a BRICS summit? Uh, actually, uh, we are very glad to see the independent diplomacy from uh, France. And uh, we can see that Western leaders are not just uh, under the monopoly of the uh, U.S.-led governance institution. Okay. So uh, even though Macron's coming, we'll have a very great encouragement for the developing world that we have much more space to explore in uh, cooperation. Yes, they're happy France is going to cooperate and they see this as a feather in their cap, no doubt. Now, will the new BRICS currency be a reality? Not according to India's external affairs minister four days ago. There is no idea of a BRICS currency, if I understood your point rightly. That currencies, to my mind, will remain very much a national, uh, national issue for a long time to come. Let's take a look at the market and also um, cover a little bit of drama in the XRP community. Yeah, I found myself in the middle of it, not intentionally. And we're going to hear two different views on CBDCs, one coming from Ripple and one from Academia. They're quite different. Bitcoin has lost some steam. It's closer to 30,000 than 31,000. XRP is down to 46 cents. There are three gainers that stand out. That would be Solana up 11%, Caspa up 12%, and eCash up 11%. Let's take a look why. Solana is up on some news. They have their NFT platform called SoulC, where Coca-Cola announced an innovative fusion bringing together physical goods with an NFT. Here's how it works. The festival goer stands in front of a magic mirror. The magic mirror dresses you in random merchandise in 3D real time. And then you scan the QR code, receive a photograph, and you've got a photo memory of your attendance. I love it. Caspa, most likely up on the announcement that they have a new bridge to Ethereum. This is interesting tech and it's blazing fast. And finally, eCash, it's on my radar now. It's public money and it has privacy characteristics. There's a really great video with Santiago Velez when he spoke uh, with Ash Bennington and the um, Rohan Gray, which is one of the founders. This is, uh, I like this project a lot. I need to research it more. I'm happy that it had a little bounce in price because it, yeah, like I said, it's now on my radar. I was in a Genfinity Twitter space yesterday with a great group of panelists. Darren Moore was the moderator. And towards the end, uh, we were joined by Dirk of Expector. And there was some frustration expressed, and that frustration was directed towards Ripple, the grants arm Ripple X, to be clear. I saw that there was a little confusion on that. There's always two sides of every story, but I'm sure that everyone should not make a solid opinion before looking into all the facts because yeah, it's spun a little bit out of control now with emotional reactions. This week was tough. We saw another UNL operator quit this week and we have now Bias Goose who was definitely a leader in the Ripple XRPL developer community completely exit from his Twitter. And I worry about another voting UNL leaving as well. Now, I'm sure that this has been bubbling for a while and 
it's going to bring some changes, which should lead to more of an equitable structure and some improved methods for expanding the XRP ecosystem with the grants, because I think there is a lot of room for improvement. I want to say that I applaud all the hard work and the builders in this space, no matter what chain they choose to build on. And here is a perfect example of those hard workers and builders in the space. This is BPM Wallet, and they're going to have their London MVP launch. This is the minimum viable product launch that will happen in 19 days, 21 hours, and 47 minutes. And I will be there. This is a project that has an interesting business use case that's solving a real problem with the utility of an NFT. I'm going to put a link to this where there is a form that you can fill out to join everybody from 1 to 6 p.m. on July 27th. It's really easy to do, and I hope to see you there. I'm going to let James Wallace, who recently was speaking about the XRP use case, followed by Sola Omorova. And she's a leading thinker on the digital currencies and professor of law at Cornell University. Yet she's not such a fan of private money, especially when it comes to stable coins by fintech companies or by decentralized crypto entities. You're going to hear some different opinions. And yeah, until next time, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye. Um, and the other, the other breakthrough we had was with something called on-demand liquidity. So this is um, where we use a native digital asset, a crypto, XRP, as a bridge currency between the sending co country and the receiving country. We, the re we call it on-demand liquidity because the way the model works is it negates the need to have uh, pre-funded Nostro accounts in the destination country. So you essentially, um, you know, you, go, you take your US dollar, you convert it th with our help into XRP, you then send it to, to Mexico, for example, and convert it to Mexican pesos. And that's all done um, in, a, in a matter of seconds. Anyone who has the technology and who can create this sort of native money transfer and record keeping or payments system. And that is what fundamentally poses a threat to the sovereign public's ability to maintain the flow of sovereign money through the sovereign uh, publicly controlled and publicly managed payment system. So what's at stake here in this debate about digital pound or digital dollar is not simply the speed or form of the payment system, but control of the creation and allocation of digitized tokenized sovereign money. So this debate is ultimately about the balance of public and pu private power in the financial system. The end game is a long way off because you, you know, if you think about it, to get everyone being able to transact cross border in this very efficient way, that requires everyone to be at a certain level of development. Yep. So I foresee that for the next, at least the next five years, maybe the next 10 years, you're going to have countries that have a CBDC trading with countries that don't have a CBDC. So then you have to accommodate fiat to CBDC. You're going to have various you know tokenized deposits and stable coins in the mix and i think they're all they will all coexist so you can't just plan for the utopia right you have to figure out how do you get there in these steps along the way and uh, that requires a lot of collaboration definitely once we start changing the infrastructure through which money financial resources flows and uh, flow and get allocated right uh, we will change the distribution of power, political power in the society. And that is a fundamental shift that then will empower certain groups that currently are not empowered to participate through various channels in the, in the policies decision-making in ways we cannot envision today.